Welcome to Dweller of the Dark. We are a channel honoring the yellowed and blackened bones of many prominent authors. We will be digging up several obscure, strange, and forgotten authors who influence many of the great horror, science fiction, and fantasy writers to date. Comment below if you like. If you have authors that you'd like to see recognized, list them in the comments or contact our author page. Subscribe for more tales of the horrifying, obscure, strange, and forgotten. We'll have quite a collection climbing out of the tombs. If you like any of our tales, comment, ring the bell, and crush the like button below. Unknown Horror Masters, the Skull and Bones Collection has risen from the grave. More beast to be released soon. Find us on Fiverr to raise seven kinds of hell. Check out our other stories and our websites. YouTube, BitChute, Rumble, Dweller of the Dark. Official website, DwellerofTheDark.com. Kindle Vela, new serialized novels and novelette. Weekly new episodes. Check out links below for Where the Wolf Dwells. The Curious Death of Dionysus Shall Not. Our books and ebooks are on Kindle Amazon. Follow, support us on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, Bandcamp. Dweller of the Dark, Children of Horror, Legion of Ghouls. Tonight, we continue our celebration of Halloween. Each night, we will be presenting tales of the best Halloween horrors ever conjured to terrify, haunt, and delight. And remember, devilishly devoted to horror and Halloween, may your souls always be. Episode 10 is Hell's Forge, Chapter 1. Dedicated to that famed howler, Thomas Swafford. The bloodthirsty Leviathan, Sharky Sharkums. The abomination with a horrific bowel disorder, Carl Meyer. The ghoulish harbinger of destruction, Hadi and his girl. The shape-shifting beast from beyond the stars. Mick Rogers, the terrifying Colossus, Tim Clissold, that fiery fiend, ARWCWB, the monstrous maniac with a machete, Max Scherzer, and the lurking demon in our view, JC Huckabee. And especially to all you children of horror and legion of ghouls who've helped build this horrific pile of bones. This one is for you as well. We climbed out of a sulfurous fiery pit, blistering our hands along the way to let this one catch eternal fire. Now save your breath for the nightmare screams. Hell's Forge, Chapter 1 September 3rd, 2022 New Orleans, Louisiana Trampas Hawk Funeral Home Madeline Hetfield Funeral Roger Hetfield was overwhelmed by the fragrant scent of roses Red roses lined both sides of the hallway entering the Trampas Hawk funeral home. Each of the floral arrangements had been gifted to him for his wife's funeral. Each to his disgust, carrying a card of hollow condolence or feigned sympathy. How these people who had sent such hypocritical atrocities never knew how Madeline Hetfield hated their false cordiality. He growled to himself. These academic hypocrites mock my beloved Madeline, even in death, with their endearing cards of ridicule. It was the indignant grins of the liches that made him aware. Jovial secret jest, as the Cretans observed the pitter of dripping water from the funeral home's roof 
onto his dead wife's waxen face. In that callous moment with this crowd of sycophants, Roger almost turned maniacal. Rumbling in a rage, he saw the owner, Trampus Hawk, run to wipe the water from her cheek. Shifting in the front, uncomfortable funeral chair, Roger lamented. If one hadn't known she was dead from a distance, they can only do so much with the cadaver wax. One would think my Madeline was crying at her own funeral. Thankfully, the procession of friends and colleagues didn't take too long to show up and pay their respects to the deceased. Their funeral speeches were brief. The eulogy at Roger's behest read in haste, and the attendees respectfully marched to St. Louis Cemetery number three. Accordingly, Roger throughout paced in his mind to be done as soon as possible with these leeches and parasites who never gave a damn of his wife or their work. It was a mixed bag, though, for the acclaimed physicist. Letting Madeline go in his mind was proving profoundly difficult. Bewildered and numb, he hadn't yet accepted the reality that she was gone. He still couldn't believe what sat in that decorative box before him was Madeline's decaying and lifeless flesh. We were just talking about the new project. We had just made plans with the caretaker to have the equipment shipped to Forge Mansion. How did we get to this point, Madeline? If you'll need anything, Dean Harris Caldwell had insisted. Anything at all, Roger? Come see me. And Roger not missing an opportunity to take the physics department up on the offer, even in a family tragedy. Never let a tragedy go to waste, mind you. Decided now was the time to finish their work. I want to complete my murdered wife's work, if you don't mind. It'll give us closure. You mean, Roger, it'll give you closure. Madeline has passed on, dear friend. She won't need the fame either, I'm sure. Dean Harris insidiously advised. I won't fund a spook hunt, period. You insult me at my own wife's funeral. And you wonder why I'm using a private investor. You have the empathy of a slug, Harris, Roger roared with the fury of a man slighted during his time of bereavement. Caldwell added one more disgusting insult as he left the graveyard. Temper, temper, Dr. Hetfield. I see that I'd better leave. I wouldn't want to be punched in the face like your last student. Why leave? Roger moved from his seat like a panther. He stood immediately in front of Dean Caldwell, then reared back his right arm, bringing it forward with his fist striking the insulting head of his department. The punch connected to Caldwell's jaw, for anyone could stop Roger. The blow held enough force to send Harris groggily to the ground. The punch at his own wife's funeral stunned all in attendance to shock and silence. Days later, despite the most arduous supporters describing Harris Caldwell's horrible behavior, and despite Roger's tenure, the head of the physics department conducted a private meeting with his friend, Thomas Bienville, the president of Tulane University. And though it was unheard of to revoke tenure, especially from a university legend, Roger Hetfield was stripped of his tenure. September 5th, 2022. New Orleans, Louisiana, Garden District, Petfield Mansion. Tad Gorman, 
one of Roger's closest friends, shook Roger's hand warmly two days later. It had been nearly two days since the events of Madeline's funeral. His right hand, assistant of their recent particle accelerator project, even shoot in members of Roger's former team through the expanse of marble and wood. All warmly walked in hugging their beloved teacher and friend. Inside the living room near a cherub and seraphim carved fireplace mantle, the final blow was delivered to him. Tad didn't hold back punches. It's official, Roger. The bastard had your tenure revoked. I've heard of Tulane faculty killing people and still keeping their tenure. This is ridiculous. Tad, it is what it is, my friend. He has tried for years to shut me and Madeline down. He knew provoking me at the funeral would be the best chance to dig in. I guess he was right. Roger sighed, trying to explain. Bite them, Roger. If not for me, or the team, for Madeline, damn it. Tad raged, trying to motivate his former boss. Roger smiled a Cheshire cat smile at Tad and whispered, We don't need their money. I have a meeting with an investor who will give us five times the funding of that useless clown. But you're right. I should sue his ass. That was uncalled for what he did at Madeline's funeral. Tad laughed and asked, ha, I guess you'll be needing a team if this investor comes through. Why, you know anybody looking for a job? Roger asked, already knowing the answer. The entire physics faculty and a few other departments would quit to work for Roger Hetfield. Roger and his cutting edge theories into the metaverse and beyond had kicked up some excitement at the university. Besides, he and Madeline had been beloved by all for being kind to students and assistants. I might know a student or two to give you a hand, Dad advised as they both sat looking out on Madeline's tropical flower garden. Roger had made a pot of coffee and poured two glasses as they talked with the rest of the team. What's the project? Roger looked at the four girls and four guys that had made up their particle accelerator program. Each were wide-eyed and fidgeting with eagerness awaiting Roger's answer. Roger in the moment recalled each student's role in their previous successes. The long hours and the tireless commitment by each had been commendable. He watched the project lead. Karen Matheson pushed back a loose curl of blonde hair intensely. Roger had recalled her brilliant theoretical calculations for the quarks. Then he turned to his right, studying a tall athletic man with brown hair and eyes, Jude Labar. Roger deepened his brow, thinking of Jude's tremendous contributions. As Roger looked on, Jude brushed back his brown hair flippantly, waiting for Roger's answer. But all the while, he and a third student competed flipping a pencil between their fingers. Yes, Jude and Karen had stumbled on the crucial piece to identify the cornerstone of Roger's new quantum entanglement theory. It had been Jude's pivotal work that led to Roger and Madeline's breakthrough with the spooky action at a distance. Roger remembered Jude had really kicked things up with calculations that proposed new pathway behaviors for muons. Together with the rest of the team, they had unlocked new doors of understanding for quantum entanglement. What this meant for the future frontiers of science was anyone's guess. But for Roger, the discoveries now proved dire. The team's work had allowed him to build the machine. With this device of Roger and Madeline's scientific devotion, the very walls of finality, maybe even death itself, could be breached. Scratching the stubble of his unshaved face, Roger studied the ambitious eyes of each team member as they sat across from him. He warned, 
I don't know if you want to follow me on this one, boys and girls. We just worked with you on the CERN project. I was about as dangerous as it gets, Dr. Hetfield. According to some, we might have opened our universe to all types of Lovecraftian nasties. <laughs> Karen snickered, leaning back in her chair. Roger thought she looked almost angelical in the radiance of the sun. Upon hearing her snickering, Tad and everyone bellowed howls of laughter. You and that weird giggle, Karen. It's too much. Roger tried not to smirk. Keeping a stern composure, he reminded everyone of the inherent dangers of exploring the subatomic universe. We still don't know if delving into those fields might not bring about some time anomalies, phase distortions, or aberrations, Miss Matheson. But you are correct. No critters showed up, nor any weird mist when we let the particles fly. A bearded, slightly chunky John Fontenot asked, are we going back to CERN? Or is this new financer ready to finally build our facility in Louisiana? Or she would like to do research in our own backyard. It's not CERN. And it's going to be more dangerous than before. This will be a project that Madeline and I have worked toward our whole. Roger stopped. He had to steal his emotions before he almost cried. He maintained composure and continued. Madeline would have wanted me to complete this. Okay, Doc. What's with all the secrecy? Tell us. What's this new and dangerous project? Jude pressed Roger for the answer. He took a sip of his own coffee in a white cup. Then once again, brushed back his flowing hair. Forge Mansion. Roger saw Jude freeze drinking his coffee. He also noted Karen and the rest of the team stared in disbelief. Tad broke the moment of silence between everyone. He hurriedly gulped a shot of his coffee, then asked, Forge Mansion? Why do I know the name, Dr. Hetfield? From what I recall, it's not really a science-related place. I argue it is, Tad. Roger wasn't saying anything beyond what he'd given already. An African-American woman Alicia Neville brushed back the twist of her rainbow-colored hair. She whispered to Tad, nodding. Forge Mansion, Dr. Gorman, is the former home of blues musician, Thaddeus Forge. He ran the roads with your favorite blues man, Nani Johnson, back in the early 1920s. Forge might have been an actor, too. A 20-year-old man with raven black hair that was thinning Alex Jericho adjusted his thick glasses, exclaiming, Hey, wait a minute, Dr. Hetfield. He's the guy that disappeared over a hundred years ago. He ran a sick. Yes, Alex and Miss Neville, Roger interrupted. Thaddeus Forge was a musician and actor. I believe he was supposed to have a supporting role one of Rudolph Valentino's movies, The Sheik. But Valentino felt Forge was upstaging him and had him removed from the film. Naturally, it's gossip and rumor. No one is still alive to give us the real story about what happened. He stood to face the group with the waning sun casting the rays off his back. There was hoodoo, voodoo nonsense related to his disappearance. Some local curse on how he got famous, too. It's more in line with the Robert Johnson Crossroads legend. I don't care about that. Jude narrowed his eyes and leaned in. What's the nonsense, sir? My mama and friends believe in some of that stuff. 
We got Black Bayou in our backyard, you know. Too many strange things happen out in the swamp. Yeah, what gives, Dr. Hetfield? You never struck me as a superstitious guy. Perry, P.J. Chigazola, a tall, lanky gentleman, leaned forward asking. The red curls of his flowing hair seemed to catch fire in the last rays of sunlight. What's this got to do with particle physics? P.J., it has everything to do with particle physics. Roger took a deep breath, then looked on the faces of each of his team. I believe the CERN and the G2 research were the finds of a century. And not just because of improved tracking of quarks and muons, but something more profound. I believe we went further than anyone could believe. Identifying the existence of extraterrestrial particles affecting electric fields was just one part of it. Whether those particles amplify or take away from other electrically charged particles was the bigger question. Actually, proving time dilation occurred was the icing on the cake. Roger beamed proudly and extended his arms out with his final words. Team, with your calculations and with the collider, Madeline, God rest her soul, and I were able to fit the biggest piece into a theory that perplexed Einstein until his dying day. And now, setting up a laboratory at Forge Mansion, we will put the piece in place. May Einstein roll over in his grave when we do. A tall, chiseled Scottish lad in his late 20s, Ricky R.C. Calhoun, asked sarcastically, well, it's just wonderful that we have more endless hours of research work, Doc. I'm down with solving the universe's mysteries, but I am puzzled beyond words at exactly what we'll be trying to solve at Forge Mansion. I mean, rather, I'm perplexed at the type of physics lab you set up in a haunted house. And make no bones about it. My friends, this is the most notorious spook house of them all. A place that I read about in one of those classic horror dregs. Why must we do research in the most horrific haunted house in the Appalachian Mountains? In the moment, R.C. looked more like an Arthurian knight of old than a physics student. From what Roger could guess, his question seemed to be on everyone's mind. Roger answered, There are places, R.C., that science has struggled to find answers for. Places that emit a type of energy, dark matter or otherwise, that has an effect on people. I believe such places exist, and we've been looking at them through the wrong lens. Energy is energy, for better or worse. Detecting it or understanding it and its applications is the core of what we all have dedicated our lives to. You call these places the Bermuda Triangle, Stonehenge, or Devil's Cavern. I call them places where a new form of energy or an old forgotten form of unidentified matter may exist. Okay, Doc, let's say you haven't lost your mind due to grief. No offense to you, sir. Alex, cleaning his glasses, interrupted. None taken, Alex, Roger interrupted back. Alex put his glasses back on and continued. How are we going to prove your forge mansion has this exotic energy? It's not like we have ever detected such stuff before. Oh, I strongly disagree, Alex. Roger Hetfield smiled a wide, knowing smile at his brilliant team. He sat back in his chair, looked out to Madeline's flower garden, then turned back to address 
the puzzled group of scientists. You, Jude, Karen, Alicia, R.C., John, and the rest of you each calculated the theoretical possibilities of these quantum entanglement particles. It's why I picked all of you, except Janice. But your work had a bigger purpose. Karen tilted her neck and lifted a brow curiously. What was the bigger purpose, Dr. Hetfield? It allowed me and Madeline to learn how to build our own large Hadron Collider. Roger shifted uncomfortably in his chair. He hated having to tell the kids that they had been duped, especially now seeing each physicist's disbelief. For better or worse, you all were spying and recording so we could build something new. Later, when the rain stormed and the power had went out in the mansion, Roger would remember his jovial discussions with his team of physicists as his knees ached from running to his room in terror and his heart thundered in his chest, listening in utter fear of something slimily dragging itself down the hall. Roger would recall. As his dread grew in unnerving unease and sweat poured from his body, he'd see the crack beneath his bedroom door illuminated by greenish fluorescence just outside. It was in the moment, on a midnight so dreary, he was frozen in fear. As chills ran up his spine, he'd remember how everyone had laughed and smirked at the dangers from delving too far into the mysteries of the unknown. How they had jested together back then of other dimensions. Hours ago, long before Roger flipped the switch to the new machine, driving the dead into existence. It seemed outrageous that horrors could be conjured by a quantum device of amplification and measurement. However, now, for Roger Hetfield, other worlds than these, other dimensions, other hells had been opened. Fumbling, falling, and fearfully trying to rationalize in the moment, Roger wasn't sure he could run back down past the phantasm just on the other side. Could he run on gout-riddled knees and stress his bum ticker to make it back to the lab and close the door to the dead? Would he want to? Especially knowing turning off the quantum collider switch might end his chance to reach out in the dimensionless beyond and be reunited with his beloved Madeline. Thank you for listening. Have a great night.